as you sit here focused on the breath, you get some hands-on experience in seeing how the mind relates to objects. On the one hand, you have the object that you intend to stay with, the breath. And you can ask yourself, where are you in relationship to the breath? And what does it mean to keep the breath in mind? On the other hand, there are other thoughts that come up, the distractions that might pull you away from the breath. And you learn about the process of how thought forms if you do your best to keep those thoughts at bay. In the beginning, it's very easy to be here with the breath and then find yourself someplace else and not know how you got there. You have to come back to the breath and make up your mind that you want to watch for the signs of how you're going to wander away. And with practice, you begin to see how many steps there are in the process, how the mind stirs a little bit to go someplace else and then stops. This is where you start seeing the committee of the mind in action. Some of the members have decided they're going to leave as soon as you're not fully alert, fully aware. They're going to take off. And then they pretend that they didn't make that decision, but it has been made. They're simply waiting for that chance. Then another stirring comes into the mind. And it's hard to say sometimes whether it's a stirring in the mind or in the body. It's right at the area where the, the two meet. Part of the mind will slap a perception on it, saying, this is a thought about that or a thought about this, and then run with it. And as you get used to trying to stop the process as quickly as you can, you begin to see the different stages it goes through. And one of the stages you want to watch out for is the one where it slaps on the thought, I am the thinker, I am the one thinking this. That's when your thinking turns into what the Buddha calls babancha. It's a hard word to translate. A scholar back in the 70s came up with the translation, conceptual proliferation. And the Vipassana community seized on that interpretation to describe any time when your mind is just totally running amok. But when you look at how the Buddha describes the process, it has nothing to do with how much thinking there is or how overwhelming the thinking it is. It's thinking that's based on certain perceptions and certain categories of thought. And it starts with that idea, I am the thinker. And from there it goes into things that you are, things that you're not, things that exist in the world, things that don't exist in the world. What's yours, what's not yours. And from there the Buddha says you get into conflict. Because once there's an I am, you create it out of your sense of attachment to your body, to your feelings, your perceptions, your thought constructs, acts of consciousness. And once there's a being, the being has to feed. It needs its world in which to feed. The problem is you run into other beings, and they're laying claim to the same parts of the world. It's just bound to be conflict. So one of the things we're trying to learn how to do as we practice is learn how to see this process and disentangle ourselves from it. Because once there's an I am and there's a world in which that I am exists, you've got a state of becoming. And you can't just decide, okay, I've had enough of this becoming. Stop it. A lot of these things, once you've got them going, they're going to last for a while. based on whatever the desire is that got them going. And in the meantime, other desires come up. You build a sense of self around those desires and a sense of who you are, 
as the thinker of those desires. And there's a whole another state of becoming. The mind's really good at creating these things. The problem is that the Buddha said, if you try to destroy these states of becoming, you're still thinking in terms of becoming, and so that creates more becoming. The way out is to try to look at the processes that give rise to the state of becoming that lead up to that point where you slap on the thought of, I am. This is why the Buddha taught dependent core rising and all those lists of causes that are variations on dependent core rising. So you can look at these things simply as processes. Like right now, try to look at your meditation as a process. Just as you looked at your mental disturbances as processes, look at what you're doing as you stay focused on the breath. This is a process too. You don't have to think about who's doing this. You don't say there's nobody doing this, because that gets you involved in wrong view. Just try to avoid that question entirely. Just say, what's the action? What's the result of the action? This is why the Buddha expresses the Four Noble Truths as cause and effect or path and fruit. There's a path of action that leads someplace. You don't have to ask who's walking the path. Just follow it. And you learn to see these things as processes before they turn into states of becoming. This is how you can get out of that kind of thinking. Now this sounds kind of abstract and very analytical. But actually, as you notice, as you're sitting here with your breath, you can get very intimate with your breath. You get very intimate with your sense of the body as you feel it from within. And you can do this without having a sense of who is doing the practice. Just getting interested in the breath, getting interested in different ways of breathing, different ways of adjusting the breath. Looking at the role that perception plays in this issue, try to find a perception that's calming, allows the comfortable breath energy to spread through the body. It makes you more and more sensitive to the whole body, all the way out to the skin, and then beyond the skin to that energy cocoon that surrounds you. As you get interested in this, and the question of who's doing this fades back in the background. It will come up when there are times when you find yourself having trouble doing this, and there's part of the mind that immediately turns on itself and says, Look, you're a bad meditator, or you can't do this, you can't even stay with the breath for more than five breaths, that kind of thinking. Okay, that's when you have a bunch of attack. Again, it's because there's the I in there. This is where you have to learn good ways to talk to yourself, to pull yourself out of that kind of thinking. Because the conflict that comes from a bunch of, is not just conflict with other beings. There's a conflict inside as well. But you get more and more interested simply in the breath, in awareness as it relates to the breath. You're thinking in different terms. And as you get more and more skilled at this, the sense of whoever is doing this begins to fade in the background. It's just a question of what actions are good, what actions are not, what actions will help with getting the mind to settle down and stay settled down, or to get it to go into deeper states of concentration. Think in those terms. And so you find yourself getting very intimate with the breath, without having to have a sense of you being there. There's just the awareness. And as I said, there's a sense of being very intimate with this. So it's not dry analysis. And at the same time, you remind yourself, 
there is a noble reason why you're doing this. As long as there's prapancha going on, there will be conflict. You leave this body and you're going to latch on to another one. You'll be the thinker in that body. And then that body's going to have to have food. And this process just keeps going on and on and on. You have to fight other beings for food. Think of the Buddha's image of all those fish in the stream. The water's drying up and everybody's fighting for that last little bit of water. They create a lot of karma as they fight one another, and then they're all going to die. It's not the case that the winners are going to have water forever. And you look at the world and it's just constant conflict. So your gift to the world is that you're going to get out. And meanwhile, you find what the Buddha said is a deathless happiness. It's not like you're just snuffing yourself out and going away into nothingness. You're finding something better, a type of happiness that doesn't require that you lay claim to anything. So this practice we're doing here is not just a, an exercise in stress reduction. It's a gift to yourself, a gift to the world. You're trying to pull yourself out of this constant conflict. Maybe you can't stop all the conflicts in the world, but you can be one less person to be involved. Because no matter how much you try to improve the world, it's never going to be good enough. We sometimes think that in that puddle of fish, maybe if you gave them a bigger puddle, make sure there was water that didn't end, the fish would be happy. But as the Buddha said, look at one person's sensual desires. It would have to rain gold coins, and still that much wouldn't be enough to provide for one person's desires. Once you get this, you want that. Once you get that, your ideas expand. It's like the case of that. There was a famous politician in Thailand who was very wealthy. And everyone assumed that once he became prime minister, there would be no corruption, because he already had all the money that anyone could imagine anyone would want. Well, it turned out his imagination was bigger than theirs. He wanted to be wealthy not only on the national level, but also the international level. In other words, there's no bounds to sensual desire. In addition to the image of the rain of gold coins, the Buddha once said, if you had two mountains the size of the Himalayas, to totally made out of gold, that still wouldn't be enough for one person's desires. So there's no way you're going to find completion in the world. The world is a world of conflict, because everybody's doing their babunching, you might say. It's only when you stop thinking in those terms that you can pull yourself out. So you have to look into your mind and see, where are you laying claim to things? You trace it back and it goes to this perception, I am the thinker. As you're thinking it, it seems innocent enough, but the implications grow. And you start laying claim to more and more. So you've got to look into this habit of laying claim to things. And see if you can simply be with the processes in the mind, processes in the body, without having to lay claim to them. Just try to do them well. And you find that that's the way out. <laughs>